Hello everyone. Welcome to another webinar promoted by SoftExpert. Today's event presents process mapping and its benefits. The webinar will be conducted by Marie Claire Pedersen, Senior Consultant and Head of Content at Process Management International Limited, PMI. Her extensive operational exposure coupled with her management accounting background led to significant benefits delivered to processes that spanned the entire organization. I wish you all a great webinar. Thank you very much, Rich. Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome. As Rich said, my name is Marie Claire Pedersen, and I'm a senior consultant with PMI. Uh, thank you for joining me for this webinar, and I trust that things are well for you wherever you are in the world. Uh, process mapping provides a fundamental foundation for many of the activities we do on a daily basis, um, as well as those one-off projects. Um, today, I'm going to take you through what I consider to be some of the key benefits, not only of the maps themselves, uh, but importantly, how you generate and use them. Considering how you engage your teams, how you develop consensus, and how you support people to do their best work. So everything is a process, whether we're conscious of it, for example, you know, responding to a customer query um, or receiving supplier component parts um, where we're following some sort of a procedure or indeed unconsciously. So if we're making a cup of coffee or getting ready for work or making dinner. One thing, though, that both the conscious and unconscious have in common is how we feel when things go well and we achieve what we set out to accomplish. And also how we feel when it doesn't go as we expected or get what indeed we were looking for as an outcome. Recently, process mapping has gotten itself a variety of new names uh, linked to using technology to capitalize on the data we have in our business systems, but the fundamentals remain the same. And it's these fundamentals that are going to be the focus for today's webinar. Whether you're mapping a high level business process or the details behind an IT system configuration, this statement is true. A process map is a graphical or diagrammatic representation of a set of interrelated activities performed in a series of steps and decisions transforming a set of inputs into one or more outputs. Um, and it's documented at a level of detail useful to the user. It's capturing what needs to happen in what order, performed by whom, using what inputs to deliver specified outputs. But process mapping is so much more than just a graphical representation that makes it easy to understand what work we're doing and how we're doing it. But before we go into these, um, let me take a quick poll. I've got a question for you. you know, what types of process maps are you currently using in your, in your businesses right now? You know, a couple of answers here, specifics. You, you don't map your processes. Um, you're using value stream maps, using integrated or swim lane flow charts, network or system maps. Um, because there are so many others, you know, tell us what else might you be using? And if you can use the chat window uh, to, to let us know so we can get a, get a view of, uh, of what you're using. And that should be on screen for you now, hopefully. Um, so I can see people have already started responding. That's fantastic. Um, MC, I'll ask you this question while people are just uh, thinking about this. Oh, what, what are you hoping to get out of this question? Why are you asking it? I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, what's currently in use. So the variety that uh, people are using, you know, what's currently popular, uh, like a lot of tools and techniques, things come in and out of fashion. Um, mm -hmm. So what is it, you know, that's currently got the focus in terms of mapping activities and organizations right now? Uh, yeah. you know, what is that focus? Okay, cool. So uh, I can see that uh, people have responded. Just give a couple more seconds on that. Um, I'm, and here we go. That should appear on screen now. So I am very relieved to see that uh, we have zero respondents to uh, number one, which is we don't map our process. Good news. Possibly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, 
again, interested to see sort of value stream mapping is still quite popular, um, as well as sort of uh, integrated swim lane flow charts and also more detailed. So this is going to be an interesting build then in what I'm going to be looking at as we go forward through this, this webinar in terms of what do we use where and why. And uh, I'd like to throw in another one as well, if I may. Um, so one of the things, uh, the, the question here around uh, integrated and swim lane flow charts, um, we see a mixture, and this may or may not get a response, but we see a mixture of vertical and horizontal um, ordered um, uh, flow charts, integrated flow charts. We tend to use vertical uh, in our teaching and in our courses. Um, if you do share in the chat, let us know about that as well. Is there a particular preference? Is there a reason why? Um, why are you using uh, what you are using? Hmm, absolutely. absolutely. Cool. Thanks, MC. Thank you, everyone, for responding to that. So let's explore more deeply then the purpose for process maps, first of all. They help us to join up the work we're doing across our businesses and organizations, um, and even into our customers and suppliers. So they help us to understand how the value that we create flows through our processes and through our organizations, um, and helps us to identify those challenges um, that prevent us from using our resources most effectively and efficiently. But let me come back to the last part of the statement that I used about uh, what a process map is. The piece about documented at a level of detail useful to the user. What do I mean about detail and level of usefulness? Well, this will depend on what you want to know. So at the highest level, we might be mapping the business as a system which allows us to see how all of the processes that we operate within our organizations fit together, or maybe not as we find, um, as we start to build this picture. Do all of the processes work together to deliver the overall aim of our business? Or do we have conflicting processes um, or areas where we have um, um, processes operating in a way that means that other processes can't deliver what they need to. As we move through the detail level, complex processes that call, uh, cover multiple departments, so for example, a new product introduction process, are best mapped in a way that we refer to as a key work system. This prevents us getting lost in the detail, but still illustrates how these complex processes need to feed into one another. Once you arrive at sort of level two mapping, we're getting into the details of what and who is needed to perform the work. At level three, shows us how the work moves between locations, departments, operators, and what decisions are required to ensure that the correct output is achieved. At level four, the most detailed level, we're looking at standard work instructions, uh, checklists, templates, single point lessons, anything that is there to support uh, the performance of the work to a particular um, standard at the task level. But who would typically use these levels of maps within your organization? Well, at the very highest level, we're looking at those people who are leading your business system they're likely to be using the level zero and level one maps for understanding how the work works and for decision making. At level two, it's your process owners, the people who are accountable for ensuring those processes deliver the um, output required by those processes. And they're likely to be using the level one and level two. Anybody who is responsible for managing a process are likely to be using level two, three, and four process detail maps. And at level four, this is what your process operators need to perform the work to their best possible outcome. So we can see here that we have different levels of detail needed for different purposes. 
And they're going to be used by different people within your organization at different times, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. But ultimately, our process mapping is for learning. Whether it's to visualize the end to end process, or we want to understand the process in detail, whether we want to support operator induction and training, or to enable operational excellence and continuous improvement. If we want to show compliance or to identify and mitigate risk or even to evidence change. What we need to keep in mind, though, is the final documented process map itself should not be the end goal. It's a means for facilitating conversation, discussion, collaboration and importantly, engagement between the people and how their work works. Effectively, it's an enabling tool. And whilst the final documented maps are useful to support process standardization, maintenance and continuous improvement, they are only as good as the team who work together to generate them. We should consider process mapping as an enabler to discovery, analysis and improvement of the work that we do within our organisations. But a process is much more than just a procedure. And done well, our process maps should encompass all of the elements needed to deliver the required outcome that's required quality by our customers. Uh, let's consider a restaurant. Um, it could be a fast food restaurant or it could be a Michelin star restaurant. In order to delight the customers and use the resources efficiently, they need to understand much more than just the steps needed to provide food to a customer. You know, they need to be able to define, for example, the knowledge, you know, taste, tasty food combinations. So what works well together? You know, who did decide that gherkins worked well on burgers or that rocket salad is the go-to garnish of choice? You know, where did that come from? How has that developed over time? How do they go about testing their theories and studying them so they become best practice? So again, this list here aren't independent. They work together to create a system um, of best practice for this organization. We think about uh, the equipment and the workplace. It also links strongly into safety. I worked in hospitality for a while and it was through having robust processes that were clearly documented that allowed us to cater for large functions, you know, providing consistent, repeatable quality and a consistent experience to the guests that came to our functions. Those of you involved in the deployment of ISO and industry standards within your organizations will have noticed the emphasis on the process approach. So when auditing, for example, the auditor should be exploring the processes that are being operated and not just looking for conformance of the output or the outcomes to the customer. They should be looking for compliance with the processes, but also any gaps in those processes that could present a risk to the delivery of those customer requirements. The process mapping is at the heart of the process approach. And by developing, implementing and improving the effectiveness of our processes, we are enhancing our quality management system and we're enhancing a customer satisfaction. We're understanding and managing those interrelated processes and we understand how they work together to contribute to our organization's effectiveness so that we can consistently and repeatedly deliver our customer requirements. The approach enables an organization to control those interrelationships and interdependencies. So we know if we need to make a change in one area, what the knock-on impact will be, and therefore what contingencies or wider improvement needs to be made so that the system keeps moving towards its goal. So let's now focus on some of those key benefits of process mapping. Um, they can fall really into two categories, either helping to deliver expectations or helping us to improve. So here are what I consider to be 
the key benefits of process mapping. So the first one for me is about communicating what happens to all stakeholders. Now we have lots of parties interested in what we do and how we do it, both internal to our organizations and outside of it. Now when they can see that an operation or activity is being operated as a process, it provides confidence that these things will happen as they should. It helps manage expectations. You know, what can I expect? How long will it take? Who is accountable? Where are the inputs coming from? What happens if something goes wrong? How is the customer protected? Interestingly, at lunchtime, I had a leaflet pushed through my door for oven cleaning services. Um, on it, it stated their 12 stages to their oven cleaning process. It got me thinking, you know, why did they include it? Why did they think it was important to let me know that they had a process that they followed for oven cleaning? You know, is it so that you know, I can have a confidence that they know what they're doing, that they wanted me to know what the process would be? You know, is it so that actually I can check that they're following that process if I was to take up their services? Now, it's possibly a combination of all of those. But it got me thinking because it's not something I've ever seen before in that sort of framework. So you know, when we can see that work is operating as a process, it can provide that confidence that things will happen as they should. At every step of our internal processes, there is a customer supply relationship. But for maximum benefit, of our mapping processes activity, we should be extending it into our upstream and downstream processes. So mapping into our external customer and then downstream into a supply base, this will help us to truly understand where value is created, how it flows and identifying the risks to the supply of that value to our customers. Between each relationship is a set of requirements that need to be fully understood. You know, who receives the output? Are we clear on their expectations, needs, and wants? Back to the voice of the customer. You know, what do they do with the output? You know, is there an opportunity to do more or indeed even less to improve the customer's experience? In order to provide the output, what inputs are needed? How are, they, how are these quantified, qualified? What frequency do we need them? How are they defined? Who provides those inputs? What happens if we don't get them or we receive insufficient? My theory is that the current global supply chain challenges for organizations cannot be fully understood, appreciated, anticipated or mitigated without process mapping the extended value chain. What question, Rich? Uh, yeah, it's a question around uh, flow charting and process mapping with the supply chain. Um, mm -hmm. So um, we're looking for recommendations as to how to engage with our supply chain to jointly process map. Should we do our side first or do it jointly with them? That's a great question. I don't think there, I don't think there's a right and wrong answer to that. Um, I think it's going to come back to you know, what's what state of the relationship do you have with a supplier at the moment? You know, is it a good relationship? Is it quite open? Um, or are you in a situation where there's a problem and uh, and therefore potentially um, you, you could be working with quite a, quite a defensive supplier? So I think it's it is going to be situation dependent. Um, ultimately, you know, we're working towards the same goal. Um, in order for us to supply to our customer, our suppliers need to supply to us. You know, if we fail, they fail. So how do we build that collaborative, um, collaborative approach to understanding, well, what helping them to understand what happens our side can really help them to understand what they need to do to improve that. Mm -hmm. But the starting point is gonna be, where is this relationship currently? You know, how open are we, are both sides in the, in the current state? But that's assumed. I, I'm, I'm guessing you'd always advocate to uh, do it jointly if possible. Ultimately, yeah, because, you know, if we can, you know, if we can put a picture together that takes us through, you know, several tiers of our supply chain right the way through to the ultimate customer, 
everybody knows what they're working towards. And if that's visible and transparent, that's how we really do create value and really understanding, well, what are the things that we currently do that just are getting in the way? <laughs> An interesting comment just come in on the back of that uh, discussion there. Um, we often, if we work with our customers to jointly map processes, we often feel exposed. Um, mm. And we have to position this situation quite carefully with colleagues. Some are up for it, some aren't. Less of a question, more of an observation. Thank yeah, you for that. Yeah. Indeed, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Gentleman by the name of uh, Peter Drucker, a world-renowned thinker on uh, leadership and management, um, suggested that, you know, and stated the importance of getting on the same side of the desk as your customer. You know, we often uh, map our processes from our own internal view and our own internal experiences of what it is we're doing and how we're doing it. But how often do we really put ourselves in our customer's shoes and, uh, and experience our operations from their perspective. So what I advocate and suggest is, you know, try and put yourself into your customer's shoes, you know, experience what they experience, you know, can you follow your process or use your product in the way that the customer does to really understand what that journey is. And it's not just the end point, it's right the way through that life cycle from when a customer first interacts right the way through to you know, a customer leaving eventually. So what is that customer journey and what does mapping that journey give us insight into over and above looking at it from our own perspectives? Can we identify where those customer touch points are? Because that's going to tell you where the value is, 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 is felt and therefore, how do we prioritize our activities and prioritize our energy around those touch points? Putting a different perspective on our mapping in terms of um, a more um, potentially subjective view in terms of what the customer is experiencing. You know, what do they think and feel as they move through this journey, as they move through the process with us? Those things can be really helpful in terms of understanding, again, what is it that we do well? Where are our opportunities for improvement? The basis for identifying and mitigating risk is through deeply understanding how our work works. If we take each process step in turn and ask, about all of the things that could possibly go wrong. You know, how likely is it to happen? What would the consequences be if it didn't happen? And how would we know if it had gone wrong? This gives us an insight into improvement opportunities. You know, how could we go about redesigning the process so that those process steps that have the potential to go wrong can't go wrong? And where we have a situation where we can't possibly design it out, how do we develop a strategy and a plan that monitors the effectiveness of the controls that we put in place to mitigate those risks and protect our customers? These three elements provide a robust mechanism for continuous improvement. They facilitate the development of insight, knowledge, clarity, acceptance, and confidence that as an organization, we have, a, we have a real grasp on what it is that we are doing for our customers and that we are actively looking for ways to improve. Our process mapping approaches give us a foundation for a way of being able to manage our work on a daily basis. If our work isn't defined and it's left alone, there'll be a natural deterioration which will cause disorder and chaos. Um, take a garden, for example, and I know I'm experiencing this right now, you know, with the weather being as bad as it has been in the UK where I live for the last couple of weeks, hasn't been a lot of, um, of work happening towards it. So it's starting to deteriorate. So I need to actually look at how do I get my garden, in this case, back to a standard? 
you know, what do I want it to look like? What do I want there to be in it? And what don't I want there to be in it? From that, I'm then looking at ways of how do I maintain that performance? Um, you know, what are the activities that I need to do on a regular basis? And what are the less regular um, activities? And again, how do I map those as processes so that when I come to need to, to do them, I've got a way of working through that. And then I'm also looking for ways to continuously improve, you know, to strip out the waste, the duplication, any inconsistencies. And as I've just mentioned, one of the key elements, how do we remove risk? You know, how do we continuously work to remove the risk from our processes and our businesses? So let's look at each of these steps, the standardize, maintain and improve in just a little bit more detail. What is the likely outcome if everyone does their own thing? And consider this rowing example. Uh, the aim is to row from one side of the river to the other, hopefully without losing anyone. But you can see in the video at the start, everyone has their own way of rowing. Uh, they're all applying different methods. But if you watch as the video progresses, they begin to learn from each other. Um, and adapt their methods or adopt other people's methods. Um, and they're becoming more effective and more efficient at, ach at achieving that aim. Now, documenting the process as a map will support the training and competency development of new process operators, mainly because visual illustrations register far faster in the human brain than just oral instructions alone. So how do you go about agreeing on the best known way? Well, one way to do this is by firstly identifying the high level process steps. You then need to identify the operators who currently form the process. Then work with them to explore and document the ways in which they perform each of the process steps um, and any concerns they have about them. So that could be around um, um, issues around risk, quality, effectiveness, efficiency, um, eight wastes that you could be capturing around those. The next step is critical to getting to a consensus of the current best known way. It's a collaborative approach where together those operators need to review what they are doing, and identify of those ways, which is the best one, best current one that they could um, adopt that is going to be the most efficient and effective of the ways they currently know how to do this work. Once they've had that discussion and identified what that might be, we're now developing a best, current best known way for operating each of those process steps. And once they've reached a consensus, we're going to need to test this process in the way that we're describing it's operated. We need to test to make sure that actually each of those methods do work together and they don't raise additional quality concerns. It, at this point, we are not looking for a perfect process. We're just looking to capitalise on the best ways people know how to do it and consolidate those into one method that everybody can agree to work to. Our process mapping gives us a foundation for maintaining performance. One of the key elements that um, we have in our organisations uh, for, for controlling performance is things like process confirmation um, or auditing. And it, our monitoring of process performance allows us to, where we have process maps, be able to look at four possible conditions to our processes. Our first question should always be, are we operating to the standard? So I should have my process map with me where I can then look at, this is what we say we're doing. How, to what degree are we actually performing the work to this standard? The second question then is, if, a, if I'm operating to this standard, am I getting the desired outcome, the desired outcome? 
What challenges or risks am I observing as I'm watching this process being operated to this standard? How do I use those to, as a learning opportunity to feed back, to be able to say, well, actually, here are the risks. These are the difficulties that this process operator is in, in, in experiencing. How can we then develop and enhance this standard? We also have two others where we might not be operating to the standard, but it does give us the desired outcome. Then there's a question around understanding what was it about the standard that meant that the operator either couldn't perform it or had found a better way of doing it. In which case, you know, how do we update our standard if that is now deemed to be the, the new best known way? But also closing the loop on, well, how, how do we encourage our operators uh, not only to identify ways of improving, but making sure it comes back into the closed loop so that all of our, our documentation is captured. The challenge we have is that if we don't do that, we have, again, variation in the way our process is operated and we're back into how do we standardise um, and get the best current known way. You know, we want to share that best practice. We want to embed it across all of our, all, our, all of our operations. So when we're carrying out process confirmation or audit activities, the process map and the control plan or the control strategy provide us with a robust method for evaluating process conformance and risk. Process mapping gives us a foundation for improvement. You know, being productive and being busy are two very different things. You know, being busy without purpose um, brings on stress because we're aware that we are filling our time with things that do not amount to any value. So think back to the comments I made at the beginning about, you know, we know when, thing, when we think we've done a good job and things have worked well, and we know how we feel when things haven't gone the way we would want them to. So, you know, by um, identifying the activities that don't add value, it allows us to look at alternative methods either to remove them or to look at different ways of being able to handle them. When we're productive, we get a sense of accomplishment, which gives us energy, focus, and actually additional drive and increased drive for further improvements. And this is both powerful and profound in the work that we do, um, because it's the reason why intrinsic motivation is usually more effective than um, extrinsic motivation. You know, the gratification that comes from completing meaningful work is only possible, though, if people understand why they're doing it and see the value in doing it. For this reason, we have to ensure that the people operating the processes have the opportunity to challenge the work they do and also seek out opportunities for continuous improvements. You know, visually being able to represent sources of waste and inefficiencies, any bottlenecks in the processes, delays, capacity constraints, allows, uh, first of all, to, for people to recognize that these are happening and then provides that canvas for us to be able to look at how we can make improvements. And ultimately, our process maps can give us a before and after sense of, you know, this is what the process looked like before. These are the changes we've made to it. This is now how it's operating. And then supported with measures, we can be able to quantify the improvements that we've made. Now, linked to this idea of uh, intrinsic motivation, our process mapping can give us a foundation for um, automating processes. But the key is that we still have to have those levels of understanding that are listed on the left hand side of that side. So we need to understand the purpose of the process, what the activities are, who are, is involved, so the stakeholders um, of that process, as well as the suppliers, the customers and the operators. We need to understand the requirements at each step of that process and define those inputs and outputs. But it allows automation allows us a potential solution 
if you like, to outsource those low value repetitive tasks that can actually have a negative impact on our motivation and productivity. But before we should be even considering process automation, we've got to take into account and look at the fundamentals of process mapping first. So what are we trying to accomplish and achieve with our process mapping? We want it to help us to build stable, predictable and capable process performance with a capacity to deliver our customers' requirements. We're looking for our, developing the ability to adapt our processes um, to our changing environments, both internal and external. At the same time, though, we need to be able to manage our customers' expectations. We're still looking for processes that deliver performance on target with minimum variation. Our process maps will help us to keep track of where we are, where we've been, and also where we're heading. One of the key challenges with, um, that I've come across with, uh, with process mapping is keeping very clearly in mind what it is we're trying to do. Are we mapping the current state, truly mapping the current state, or are we mapping a what we perceive to be what we are doing? Subtle, but very could be potentially very different. So when it takes quite a, um, um, a skill and a development of our capabilities to be able to put to one side our assumptions about how the work works and really investigate and challenge our own assumptions to be able to map the real process that is in operation. Unless we can do that, we potentially are selling ourselves short in terms of those opportunities for improvements because we lead ourselves into that false sense of, of, of security, if you like, of thinking this is what is happening when actually that's not the reality. So a few things to help you get the best from mapping your processes. Be clear on the purpose for mapping the process. What are you trying to accomplish? Are you looking at truly and deeply understanding what you're currently doing? Or are you looking to develop a future state? And that's perfectly acceptable, but be really clear on what it is you're trying to do. That then helps to think about the level of, of detail. So agree the scope up front, you know, how broad are you going and how deep in terms of detail. So think about the pyramid that I showed earlier on in, in, in this webinar. What level of detail do we need to go to and agree that? And of course, everything's a theory until we test it. As you start to map and you think actually you're too, in too much detail, you need to come up a level, then re-agree the scope. Or indeed, you may need to go into more detail. That's OK, but redefine the scope so everybody knows what we're trying to accomplish. Ensure you engage the appropriate people. And of course, you can't do that unless you know what your purpose is and you've agreed the scope. But it's the people with that inside knowledge of the process and how it's operating and what happens when and all those little intricate activities and details. That's potentially what you need when you're mapping your processes, especially when you get to the level four. Be clear on what you are mapping. As I mentioned, you know, are you looking at current state or future state? And be prepared to keep challenging one another as you're going through this activity. You know, statements like, you know, can we just validate that that is what's happening? You know, don't just map from, um, from your own knowledge or map from, um, from memory. Go and absolutely go and observe the processes. Make sure that you look at them, not just once, but multiple times by different people so that you can get a real sense of what the actual activity is, not just the perceived activity. And be prepared to have lots of debates about what happens. You know, these are really high value um, and conversations that shouldn't be stopped and you should prepare to have the time for that. 
So as you're planning one of these activities, think about how are you going to facilitate those types of conversations and uh, create space to have them during your activity, your workshops or activities. Allow people time to reflect. For some people, this might be the first time they've ever seen their work described this way. It might be the first time they've ever got a real appreciation of how they sit in the value chain and what's happening upstream of them and what's happening downstream of them. Give people time to reflect and come back with questions or indeed the ability to be able to challenge what we've actually created. This will build more depth and breadth of understanding both within the people involved, but also allows us to validate and, uh, and, and reconcile any differences that we might have in our understanding of the processes. And foremost, remember that the reason we are mapping our processes is to encourage learning, either about the way we're currently doing things, the risk presented, um, helping others to learn about the work that we do in the way we do it, helping us to understand what opportunities are, might, might present themselves for improvement, and ultimately understanding how the work works together. Now, over the last 18 months, we've been running our webinars, and uh, these ones on the screen are some of the webinars that um, explore related aspects of this topic. Uh, you can find them on our Knowledge Hub, um, on our website, and it just tends, goes into different aspects of this idea and how process mapping might sit at the heart of some of these. So in summary, process mapping facilitates learning. Be clear on the purpose and scope before you begin. Consider your supplier customer relationship at each process step and make sure you define those requirements. Extend your process mapping activities to fully understand the extended value chain. Make sure you involve your process operators, your customers, your suppliers in any of your mapping activities. And make sure to use your process maps as a foundation for your operating quality and risk management systems. Your process maps aren't a one-off activity that are done and then you're know, filed away somewhere and only ever see the light of day when you have an audit. These are foundation documents, foundation approaches to build an efficient and effective and agile business. Thank you. Hi, MC. That was that was a, that was a sudden pause there. Um, so don't think you're getting away that easily. We've got plenty of uh, questions, comments, Excellent. and observations that we'd like to put for, put to you. Um, so just a collection of uh, from the various forms, from the live streams, and from the chat in in, in this section. Um, so uh, comments. Uh, we've got uh, horizontal flow charting for us because that's Visio's default. Good enough reason as any. Yep. Um, a comment around uh, a supplier or customer having a process does not mean that the process or the supplier or customer are capable. Okay. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Good observation. Good, dist good distinction. Um, a question. Uh, on the levels and hierarchy image that you put up with the different levels of uh, process, um, where would you recommend we start? Do we need to do it all at once or is there somewhere we should start? Doing it all at once, um, I would avoid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's very diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely, that would give you process mapping overload. Um, um, <laughs> it depends, is actually the, <laughs> it's the right answer here. Um, but let me elaborate on that. Um, what is the current need in, in the organisation? Um, you know, is there something very specific in a specific area that needs mapping? Then I would go there first. It's sort of like, where's the energy um, for this and the, the immediate need? And then you can. So, so that could potentially be a sort of level three, the sidebot level um, or level three, the integrated flowchart level, I should say. 
but you can then move up and down. So there's, it's not sort of you start in one place and you can only move in one direction. You can move both vertically and horizontally within that pyramid. I'm assuming also you'd recommend uh, in the air, when you do pick an area, start small and build from there. Yes, yes. Get, get, get your process of mapping a process together. So understand what the steps are that you need to do, who needs to be involved, what the inputs are you need, what the output is you're looking for, and indeed sort of PDSA your, your approach to mapping a process before you go too big. Yeah, 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 great. Um, okay, so uh, an interesting one, slightly controversial. Uh, how would you recommend settling agreements, disagreements about which is the best known way is actually the best known way when standardizing processes? So my, my default for that, when I've been in conversations and discussions is, is it something that is fundamentally important to the operation of the process? Or is the fact that it, person A does it left-handed and person B does it right-handed, does it have no actual fundamental impact on the, the, the way the process operates and its outcome? So that's the different differentiation for me in terms of actually, do we need to have this discussion and get to a, an agreement? Or actually, is it something that that's flexible? You can use either way because it's, it still gives us the same desired outcome. Yeah, no, no, I think you could, uh, you could add on to that as well. If in doubt, uh, the data wins. So go and test it. Go and test all those ways. I mean, you have, you, before you can um, sort of agree your best known way and take that forwards, you have to test that. So if you've got multiple ways and people haven't used those ways, Again, remember, people have to learn how to do things differently. So it may not be natural to them straight away. So they'll go, well, actually, this doesn't work for me. This is uncomfortable. Yeah. Does that mean that it's not the best way? Or is it, does it mean that actually it's so new to them that actually they need time to, to get used to it? So again, one of the things we have to think about in our businesses is how we create the space to do this experimentation whilst in most cases, these processes are still operating. So we need a way to, con to carry on working whilst we're doing the experimentation. Yeah, indeed. And final question, um, um, any recommendations for mapping processes virtually, software or otherwise? As long as you have a mechanism for collaboration, so that you have a way of being able to bring people together, whether that's uh, physically or virtually. Um, as long as you have a way of being able to collaboratively document that process, uh, what we're finding, certainly what I'm finding with a lot of uh, transactional processes, uh, working at do, uh, mapping them in a virtual environment actually works really well because instead of everybody trying to sit around one computer watching somebody do it, what we're doing is we're observing what's happening through the system and through the screen because they're screen sharing. So practical, uh, practical uh, processes, a little bit more difficult, but needs a bit more creativity. Um, so, and again, it's, it's uh, getting agreement, like things like being able to video operators, um, how we share that information and that data. Um, but being able to, to bring that together collaboratively, and I think for me at the heart of that is helping and, and ensuring everybody before we move forward understands that what we're doing is for learning purposes mm. and effectively to help everybody be able to do a better job in a better way. So it's great because it is pushing the boundaries of creativity. Um, Within PMI, we, uh, we, use, um, um, we use Teams, we use um, uh, Miro, Miro uh, which, is our, yeah, <laughs> which is our collaborative workspace. So we're using those two things together um, to, to do that. And, and I think it's, again, it's the empowerment piece. So rather than having one person who's doing all the writing, for me, the value is that everybody can actually get involved and can 
in the same way as you would move physical post-it notes around, a way of being able to move virtual post-it notes around. On behalf of Soft Expert, thank you for the presence of everyone who participated in this event. If you have any questions, please contact the presenter via email. To see other webinars, ebooks, and white papers on this subject, please visit our website at www.softexpert.com. Find out more about Soft Expert solutions for business compliance, innovation, and digital transformation. Thanks for listening. See you next time.